Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the BDO Autumn Budget 2017 webinar. My name is Ed Swan. I'm a partner here at BDO, and I'll be your host for today's event. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping first off. Um, as you run through this presentation, please feel free to ask any questions you have. I think you should see a little panel on the right-hand side of your screen that will maybe do that. Similarly, uh, if you have any tech issues, uh, again, use the panel and uh, let, let our people know, and they will try and resolve them for you. So, thanks for very much for joining us today. Uh, what we'd like to do, really, is give you uh, an overview of some of the highlights from yesterday's budget. So, um, with, within that, we're, um, we're going to give you a bit of uh, context to uh, what this kind of had to say yesterday first. Uh, and then we'll cover off some of what we think are the key areas. So we'll do a bit on the, the personal tax, innovation and investment side. Uh, a bit on property taxes, there's quite a lot yesterday around that area. Uh, some uh, of the, the changes around employment taxes. And then finally, uh, quite a bit on avoidance, evasion, non compliance. Uh, with a few concluding remarks, and then some time, hopefully, to uh, cover off your questions. So, so to look at the context and background of this first, um, I think it's, it's important to recognise what uh, Philip Hound had to play with yesterday. Uh, this first slide shows that it's been an improving economic position in terms of the, the level of deficit, but the, the ultimate uh, goal has been to operate at a level of surplus by the end of the Parliament. That looks pretty unlikely now. But nevertheless, I think the, the, the general trend is in the right direction, subject to a blip uh, in this particular year that's been predicted at the moment. But overall, it did give him maybe a bit more to play with than, than has happened in the past. Here are some of the, the headline numbers that give you a, a some other economic indicators, growth is at uh, reasonably low levels, Bank of England estimating something like 1.7% for the year. If you look at inflation levels, they aren't spectacularly high, but they are running higher than uh, average wage rises. Um, retail numbers uh, are described on this slide as steady, I think. The October numbers for this year were actually uh, not quite as good as steady. Um, certainly on the high street retail side, obviously the online space in, the, in that area is, uh, is doing a lot better. And then if you look at interest rates, well, they've gone up to half a percent, which obviously in, in sort of historic terms is still incredibly low, but, but there is an expectation they may rise slightly again during 2018. And finally, unemployment stats are, you know, pretty low, 4.3% and falling. This next slide is quite an important one, I think. Um, Philip Hammond did mention this yesterday, that Chancellor does not really like mentioning things that aren't going particularly well. Productivity is one of those areas that has repeatedly uh, gone below expectations for each of the last 10 years and beyond. This gives you a sense of what was anticipated going back to 2010, um, and what was then anticipated only six months ago, and where we're at now. So certainly productivity is, is a problem for the Chancellor, and I think some of the measures that came out yesterday are as a consequence of that, trying to sort of encourage investment in areas that might uh, improve these numbers. And then finally, there is this piece uh, that looks at the, the gap between what we spend and what comes in in terms of taxes. Obviously, this graph highlights the pretty current position we were in back in sort of 2010 and how that gap has narrowed since then. Um, clearly, it's not got all the way there yet, but it certainly gave Mr. Hammond, I think, a bit more to play with than maybe uh, he's had in the past. And I think the other sort of political factor to overlay on the economic is that obviously Mr. Hammond was uh, with the previous budget where one of his uh, headline 
measured was the subject of a backbench rebellion and therefore had to be shelved, the, the NIC was born. So he clearly going into these budgets didn't want to do the same again. And, and so I think what we found is that any of the, the sort of more radical measures were tended to be things that were sort of more pleasing to the backbenches than, than challenging for them. So hopefully that gives you a bit of background to all of this. I'll now pass on to my colleague Hilary Sharp, who will talk to you a bit about what's going on in the world of personal taxes, innovation and investment. Thank you, Ed. One of the themes of this year's budget was helping families to cope with the cost of living. The government most committed to achieving a personal allowance of £12,500 and a threshold of where you start to pay higher rate tax of £50,000 by 2021, as we shown in the graph. And yesterday's measures were uh, a small step towards this, increasing the personal allowance to £11,850 and the higher rate thresholds to 46350 And just to put that in context, that means for a basic rate taxpayer, there will be an additional saving of £70. For a higher rate taxpayer, the saving will be £340. And for an additional rate taxpayer, who's paying tax of 45%, the saving will be £250. And we've mentioned some figures there for Scotland. Those at the moment are just estimated because they won't be finalised until the Scottish budget is in December. Other than the changes to personal allowances and higher rate tax thresholds, there have been no changes to the income tax rate for 2018-19. However, it's probably worth just mentioning a couple of measures that were announced in the previous budget, which will start to take effect from 2018. And the most significant one of this being the reduction in the dividend allowance from £5,000 down to £2,000. So that will impact particularly on higher rate taxpayers who have a substantial amount of dividend income as they'll now be paying a great amount of tax. There are also two new allowances which have been introduced for incidental trading income and property income, and these will be of £1,000 each. Disappointingly, uh, the Chancellor made no uh, attempt to introduce additional incentives for savers. The ISA allowances and the lifetime allowances have remained unchanged, um, although there is a small increase in the junior ISA allowance. The tax savings tax, the annual exemption has increased to 11,700, and the tax rate has remained the same, so uh, up to 20% for normal disposals, 28% for disposals in residential property, and for investments which qualify for entrepreneurs, we still have the 10% rate of tax, which is good. There's been no changes in the income tax relief, uh, the rate of income tax relief available for investments in EIS, CDIS, and the ACT, um, and I'll come on to talk a little bit more about EIS in a moment. One of the uh, speculation in the press prior to the budget was that there would be some significant changes again to pensions. Uh, thankfully, we are pleased to say that there haven't been, although the annual pensions allowance has remained at 40,000. And an important point here for those of you who have um, income in excess of 150,000 is that that annual allowance can be reduced down to a minimum of 10,000 pounds. So it does mean that you have to actively monitor the pension contributions going into your pension to make sure that you're not exceeding these annual allowances because if you do exceed them, then you'll be paying tax at your highest marginal rate on the excess. For the lifetime allowance, for those of you um, getting close to retirement, that has actually increased in line with CPI from the current rate of a million to one million and thirty thousand. And finally, for inheritance tax changes, there's been no change again. The rate remains the same as the annual rate band. A significant theme of the Chancellor's budget was his commitment for investing in innovative businesses and technology. And this follows a study that was undertaken in November 2016 with uh, major industry leaders in this area to try and look at ways to encourage investors to provide what they call the long-term patient capital that startups and innovative businesses require to develop and to grow. And so yesterday they announced a 10-year action plan which is aimed to release up to 20 billion of patient capital into startup, innovative and new technology businesses. And 
the negotiations through three measures. One of these is to establish a new investment fund to be managed by the government-controlled British Business Bank for investing into innovative businesses. There's also going to be consultation with the pensions regulator to see if it's possible for pensioners to invest in longer term and perhaps more illiquid investments as part of their investment portfolios to try and increase the amount of capital available. The final measure is extending the tax relief which is available for knowledge intensive firms through EIS and VCT. And a knowledge intensive firm really is one which is involved in research and development and creating intellectual property which can then go on to lead to the development of new of new or improved products and processes. So how they change the EIS relief? Well, currently, an individual can invest up to a million pounds per annum into EIS company shares and obtain a tax relief of 30% of the value that they invest. So they'll have a 30% reduction from their tax bill. There's also added incentives if they uh, continue to hold their shares in EIS companies for the required periods of time, in that on the final disposal of those shares, any gain would be free of that gain tax. And also the shares could qualify for business property relief for inheritance tax property. So there's some very generous relief available for EIS. And what the Chancellor announced yesterday is extending EIS to allow individuals to invest up to two million from 6th April 2018, provided that additional ten million is invested into knowledge intensive firms. Now as a way of trying to redirect EIS investment into these knowledge intensive firms, what the government is going to do is to look at restricting the relief on other EIS investing investments. So in order to obtain EIS relief, the other companies, they must have the objective to grow and develop. And there must the investment must be at a significant risk of loss of capital. And that loss of capital must exceed the uh, the rate of return. The purpose really is to move the IS investments away from what is considered to be low risk investments into these more innovative high tech areas. Again, on the theme of innovation, there's an announcement now that the R&D expense for tax credits for large companies, for companies with more than 500 employees, is to be extended from 1st January 2018 from 11% to 12%. Uh, and that seems, that seems more percentage than 1% increase. But what that means in real terms is that for every £100 of cash spent on R&D, a large company can receive a benefit of £9.72. And just a reminder on R&D, what R&D is, is it's work which is an advance in science or technology which is aimed at resolving scientific or technological uncertainty. And as well as the relief available for large companies, there are very generous relief available for small companies, which is companies with less than 500 employees. And in these circumstances, for every £100 spent on R&D, there's an extra, uh, this is worth a cash benefit of 25 Sorry, £25. And when you're thinking about R&D, it's important not to think about it just as being men in white coats um, undertaking sort of blue sky thinking and looking at testes and bumps and burners. It's actually much wider ranging than this. And it covers any activities which are aimed at developing new or improved products, processes, materials, devices or services. And so it's important not to assume that the work that you're doing won't qualify for R&D relief, because we are finding that we can claim relief in most unexpected circumstances. We've had lots of success in things like computer software, um, machines that alter the shape of bottles, as well as new products and uh, new technological activities. And just to give some example of how keen uh, the government are to encourage companies to claim R&D tax relief, this is just showing you on the table the level of increase in claims over recent years. And so at the moment, claims for R&D tax credits are in excess of 25,000 per annum. And it's really because the government sees R&D as being a way of improving growth and productivity going forward. So I would really encourage all of you to consider what work you are doing in business to see whether or not R&D can be claimed. 
Uh, I'd like to hand over to uh, Sean Mitchell, my colleague, who will talk to you about some of the changes to property taxation. Thank you, Hilary. Yeah. So, uh, my name is Sean Mitchell. I'll talk you through the announcements made in yesterday's budget, which uh, concern real estate and construction. Um, there are a number of measures, particularly on housing, um, to affect everybody in that sector. There were some measures which were perhaps more widely applicable to the real estate sector, but to a rather lesser extent, the analysis will affect the um, vast majority of individuals and, and certainly a, a significant portion of people too. Uh, so the, since, the, since the crash of 2007, house price rises have taken place, which is perhaps a nice place to be if, if you own a property. Um, the issue I think is, or the issue the government sees at least, is that as prices have increased and perhaps as wages have not kept up with that, affordability for, for first time buyers in particular um, has been a problem. Um, so there's, there's perhaps two ways to, to tackle that, and I think in the, the, the package of measures announced in the budget primarily this, this time around aimed at looking at encouraging the supply side of, of, that, of the equation. So there's a stated target of 300,000 new homes to be built, which is a target for the genius um, in the next four or five years. In 2016-17, there were 217,000 properties built, which is about the same level that new property, net new properties were just at the time of 2007-8. Uh, financial crisis, so we're getting back to some levels of normality. The, the measures, uh, 16.3 billion of new money was announced yesterday to, to try and stimulate supply, which included money for a land assembly fund to try and bring land um, to the market for, for new construction, infrastructure fund to, to facilitate access to bits of land which might not be accessible or provide properties and services for the properties can be built. And in particular, there's an 8 billion of funds announced to guarantee lending to the smaller house building um, population, which might find it more difficult to get credit from financial institutions. So those were, were welcome changes. There was an interesting comment about um, looking at the commission, reporting commissions to, to compare the final commissions granted with the number of properties built out. <coughs> there has been um, a gap, there's been more commissions granted than built. So, um, on the back of that inquiry, the housing or the Holiday Communities Agency, which will be renamed from England, will receive new powers in respect of planning and the ability to make compulsory purchase orders. I think the Chancellor announced yesterday that he will um, expect or have to exercise if the report on um, planning versus build out demonstrates that land being held back or, or withheld under living circumstances where there's genuine commercial difficulties. Um, and there was a, perhaps a slightly difficult listen on, on the Today program this morning where the, the Chancellor was challenged about a company called Castle Mean Limited, which allegedly has sat on a pot of land in Wales for about seven years, and allegedly which the Chancellor has at least some connection to. Um, the, the other thing which was announced yesterday, which I think has been successful, scheme the health to buy scheme, there was a further 10 billion of funding uh, to assist in uh, either buying uh, properties. So before we look at the changes, I think it's, it's important to look at the context in which the, the, current, or the, the current budget has dealt with property by perhaps looking back just to see what's been done previously to try and tackle the, the issue with, with property. Now these measures which have been announced over the last um, four or five years are concentrating more on trying to dampen the demand side, where this, this budget seems to be more increasing in the supply side. We can see from uh, changes made that there were some high rates of SDLT brought in for some sort of tax avoidance where properties are being tied up in, in um, companies and trusts and such like, uh, and annual tax charges levied on those. Demand is also attempted to be dampened by taxing on residents on gains on residential properties, which wasn't the case before 2015. There's then a 3% surcharge for SDLT on second homes or particularly five to less, which again is looking to dampen demand and hopefully therefore prevent sort of too much um, heating up of the, of the property market. Um, PDT rates when they were dropped to 20 cents for everything else remained at 28 percent for residential properties. And then most recently we've seen the introduction of a restriction on the rate of 
actually which are a debt on residential property rights and to the Companies are also been affected by the 3% FDIC surcharge. And then this year the, the introduction of a cap on interest um, tax relief for companies, which affects all companies actually, but will be particularly achieved for property companies or investment companies, which are uh, typically more highly geared perhaps than um, certain businesses. So turning to the measures which we uh, which were announced, the headline grabbing measure was the SDLC relief for first time buyers, which was applied to completions from which is day where the consideration is £20,000 or less. Um, as you would expect, there are certain conditions which are required to be met to get the relief, and there must be single dwelling bought by the individual, family for investment, must be the only or main residence of that individual. Um, say it's further down, that doesn't apply to non-residential or mixed use or if, um, additional dwelling, so it's like the first £300,000 of value not chargeable to SDLT, um, that figure previously was 125000 and then if the property cost between three hundred and five hundred thousand, the excess will be charged at the normal rate of flat bound, which is five percent. So the relief is worth a maximum of five thousand pounds for uh, for a buyer, but that's at the three hundred thousand or more uh, price bracket. Even average price is expected that the same will be more around the mark of one thousand seven hundred pounds per purchaser. And that will be influenced by where in the UK the buyer is buying, given the difference in property prices across different regions of the UK. Um, there, I suppose what one fact on that is the Office of Budget Responsibility, which published report yesterday, did forecast that this change will increase property prices by about 0.3%. As you work the maps through the existing property ownership population, they will actually benefit to a greater tune collectively than first time viable benefit from the SDLT change, uh, but hopefully with the other supply side measures, it will keep the top seat prices more stable. There's other minor changes on SDLT, um, which are um, not substantial, but for example, an anomaly where the three percent surcharge might be applied on the buying of property in a divorce. Uh, one measure which wasn't mentioned in the sense of speech, but on which there is a uh, consultation, is the proposal to extend the capital gain tax charge to, on non UK residents to all forms of UK property. Previously, I mentioned it was brought in, and the charge was brought in for residential property from April 15. The proposal is that from April 19, all UK land and property, including commercial, hotel, any, any form of non residential will now be subject to, uh, non residents will be subject to UK tax on that. It will also apply actually where non residents sell shares in companies which derive more than three quarters of their value from UK land and property. Um, so, therefore, preventing people putting properties into envelopes or wrappers and selling the shares, which they will still be subject to tax on those. Um, and there's been, there's been a widening out of the application of the TGT charge on residential property to some entities which might have been exempt before, such as widely held investment funds. There will be some protection for certain non-resident investors uh, to sell shares in property-rich companies by the tax treaty network which the UK has. Uh, but the UK is going to address that and, and also the tax treaties. That will take some time. There are also some rules which prevent people planning around for moving structures so that they fall into one of these tax treaty favoured jurisdictions um, between now and the introduction of the new rules. Uh, just briefly on some of the other property tax changes, announcements on, on business rates, the planned change from retail price index increases in business, business rates to the consumer price index is being brought forward to April next year rather than April 2020 as was previously planned. The business rate revaluation interim period has been shortened from to three years from five years which I think was filled in the Chancellor's speech at um, preventing businesses having significant shocks in, in large rate increases every five years. But the more cynical view might be that reviewing every three years when you take compounding into effect actually gives a uh, better result for the exchequer or the local authorities in terms of business rates. Selection. There was 
a welcome remedy for the long decision that on business rights where entities occupied multiple floors in, in the same building were set to rates as if they were separate businesses, uh, which gave them a higher tax bill just because there was um, shared access to those different floors. That, that will now be changed and businesses will be assessed on their self occupancy in the building, which should be changed bills for, for businesses. And reclaims can be made where businesses have been assessed on that old what that seems to be on a fair basis. Um, final couple of other points that the allowance for inflation to offer to wash out or prevent inflation gains to be taxed in companies, which was done by allowing for a retail price index um, increase in the cost of an asset for its tax, is being withdrawn from the end of this year. This catches up change which came in almost 20 years ago for individuals actually um, in 98. So that will increase, so it will affect all companies, but uh, a bigger effect on property companies who will have more assets which are subject to corporation tax and gains. And then just finally briefly, another one which is looking to level the playing field, some might say, for, between resident and non-resident companies, but non-resident companies historically haven't been in corporation tax regime, having to dip to income tax will now be within the corporation tax regime, one of the effects of which is that they will also talk about restrictions on interest deductions which UK centric groups will, will also suffer. So that's a brief run through some of the property um, aspects of the budget and I will hand over to my colleague Juliette who will talk you through the important aspects. Thanks Sean. Good afternoon everyone. So as usual, the Chancellor didn't announce anything of note from an employment tax perspective in his speech yesterday. But looking at the details, there are, in addition to the usual changes in rates and allowances for net insurance and minimum wage, etc., a number of employment tax consultations that will impact all businesses, regardless of size, of which at least one is likely to increase employment tax risk and the employment tax compliance burden for employers. So let's take a look at the key points. Two of the employment tax consultations are in respect of non-payroll labour. And the first of these suggests that the off-payroll working in the public sector rules, which came into force on the 6th of April early this year, may be extended to the private sector. To recap, these rules currently apply to public sector bodies that engage personal services of an individual via an intermediary, typically a personal service company or a one-man man limited company or an employment agency. In essence, these rules require the public body to perform an employment status assessment for workers they engage to provide their services personally via an intermediary. If on assessment the worker is deemed an employee for tax purposes, Payment of their services must be treated as a deemed employment income payment and be paid subject to page work and class one mass insurance via payroll via the public body or agency depending on who in supply chain is paying for the workers intermediary. Now surprisingly this has resulted in additional and onerous employment tax compliance burden on public bodies. At this stage, the government has only stated it will consult on tackling of payroll working in the private sector using the experience of the public sector reforms, rather than proposing a straightforward rollout of the reforms to the private sector, which perhaps is because politically it's a top potato, but it's difficult to envisage what other workable alternatives could be introduced instead. So watch this space. The second of the consultations on non payroll labour is in response to the Matthew Taylor Review, which was commissioned by the government as part of their ongoing review of employment practices in a modern economy to address the growing concerns around the gig economy, which have recently been highlighted by a number of high profile cases on worker status, including the Uber, Hermes and Deliveroo cases. The consultation will therefore consider how to make employment status test for both employment rights and tax clearer. This could result in greater certainty of treatment for engagers and workers alike, 
If, for example, it leads to a simple statutory employment status test, similar to a statutory residence test, we would hope that it does not lead to greater ambiguity on an already complex issue. So looking at the bigger picture and the government's package of measures and potential changes for non-payroll labour, does this herald the end of self-employment tax status for workers required to provide their services personally? Well, the direction of travel by the government is certainly moving towards limiting the circumstances where businesses can pay for personal services of an individual off payroll, and is increasing the employment tax compliance burden to such an extent that perhaps it is hoping businesses will decide it's just easier to pay all workers on the payroll subject to pay and mix, despite the additional cost of doing so. The overriding message here is arguably that businesses should be considering what non-payroll labour they currently use, how the anti-avoidance measures already in place and those being consulted on will affect their operations, and how they will ensure compliance to best manage their risk. We would strongly encourage businesses to go through an exercise that ultimately identifies their non-payroll labour risk profile in order to identify and prioritise risk management actions. Now, moving away from the consultations, uh, there were the usual increases in rates and allowances, and for national insurance, they're reproduced here. Notably, there is no change in the rates of national insurance, which is good. In terms of national minimum wage and national living wage, these have been increased by around 6%. And while this is good news for um, employees, it may discourage or even limit the ability of businesses take on more staff. Moving on to changes that come in from April next year, which were announced in the last budget in relation to tax treatment of termination payments, it's probably worth just recapping on what these are. The payments in the of notice or pylons will all be taxable regardless of whether they're contractual, customary or neither. Payments for injury for feelings will no longer be able to be exempt. Foreign service relief will be removed for all UK resident taxpayers except seafarers. But the, the national insurance rules don't actually change until April 2019, when employers' national insurance will be due on the excess of any termination payment exceeding 30,000 to mirror the current tax treatment. Other notable changes that come in from April next year are that pension order enrolment, the employer's minimum contribution will rise to 2% of earnings. And others relate to benefits in kind. So there will be no benefit in kind on electricity that employers provide to charge employees' own electric vehicles, but it isn't really explicit on whether this is just the charging at the employer's premises. Also, Company car tax diesel supplement increases from 3 to 4 percent, applicable to diesel cars only, that don't mean they meet the real driving emissions set to standards. If they do, though, there's no supplement. And this signals the government's intention to discourage the use of diesel cars. As diesel cars are often the backbone of any company car fleet, businesses will need to consider the impact it has for them and consider the cost the impact of moving away from diesel or sticking with it. And finally, company car and van fuel benefits and company van benefit multipliers will just increase by part the yeah. Another notable announcement was in relation to disguise and remuneration. Again, more pay and an anti avoidance measures. As you may be aware, there is existing legislation to tackle tax avoidance in relation to disguise and remuneration schemes operated by closed companies. It has now revised these rules via the closed company gateway test to put beyond doubt that contributions to such schemes should have been taxed as employment income and therefore occasion and mix will be due. The also introduced a requirement for employees and self-employed individuals to provide information to HMRC and disguise remuneration loans outstanding on the 5th of April 90 by this date to ensure the disguise remuneration loan charge is complied with. Finally, returning to the employment tax consultations announced yesterday, 
there are two on expenses of employment. The first is on extending the scope of existing tax relief for work-related training available currently to employees and self-employed to individuals that self-fund training. The second is on improving guidance on employee expenses and the process for claiming tax relief for unreimbursed employee business expenses. Both of these are welcomed. Another welcome announcement is that from April 19th, employers will no longer be required to check receipts and reimburse and get employee for subsistence using benchmark scale rates, which is a significant administration easement. But what about other agreed rates for accommodation subsistence, for example, the Road Haulage Association speed cap rates? Will it apply to them? We need to wait and see. And also, from the 6th of April 19, the concessionary accommodation and subsistence overseas scale rates will be put onto a statutory footing, so they will have equal standing to the benchmark rates. Well, that's it from me. I'll now pass you over to Ed, who's going to cover tax avoidance, evasion, and non-compliance. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, yeah as, as, as ever, the, uh, as ever, certainly the last six or seven budgets, uh, there was a lot of uh, detail yesterday around tax avoidance, evasion, and non-compliance, including a, a separate paper on the topic. So, I think the one of the things that uh, both the Chancellor and HMRC are very keen to play back is, is how successful they have been over the last five or six years in uh, reducing the impact of tax avoidance and evasion and improving the level of compliance to the, the tax regime. Um, people may be aware of uh, the UK tax gap report that is published once a year, the, the latest version came out in October of this year, and, and that shows uh, a record low UK tax gap of 6%, and the UK tax gap is effectively the difference between the amount of tax that should be collected uh, according to the, the, the rules and regulations in place and the amount of tax that actually is collected. To give you an idea of where 6% sits, uh, five years ago, the number was close to 10 percent. So, how have HMRC achieved that? Well, since 2010, the government has apparently introduced more than 100 measures to, to actually reduce that gap. And in the course of that, HMRC have managed to collect an additional 160 billion of tax in respect of those measures. In terms of the current 6 percent tax gap, quite interesting to see that HMRC believes that that breaks down into the, the following areas. So, the small and medium-sized businesses contribute 46% of that tax gap. Interestingly, the HMRC believes that mainly due to uh, careless errors rather than something more sinister. Then, in, next in line is large businesses and then criminals clearly are, seems to be very sinister, um, followed by individuals at 11 percent. So, um, moving on from So, the main areas that they that they've used to bring in that 160 million are uh, the four items highlighted here. So, firstly, They've taken a, a, a lot of work on marketing tax avoidance. So, obviously, the, the GO tax regime, the disclosure of um, tax avoidance scheme, has been in place for over 10 years now, uh, and that has had a significant impact in stopping businesses from getting involved, involved in some of the, the marketing tax avoidance schemes. Um, Alongside that are the accelerated payment notices, which are levied on GOTAS schemes, which are effectively under review and undergoing a legal process. And that, that accelerated payment notices process has enabled HMRC to pull in an awful lot of money that effectively is sat there waiting the outcome of those, uh, those court cases 
I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of that of, of those money uh, never get repaid because HMRC have also been very successful in the courts. Secondly, they've been doing a lot of work around tax evasion and the use of off offshore tax structures. At the heart of that, there's been a, a great improvement in information sharing between the UK and overseas and offshore jurisdictions, coupled with vastly increased penalties for offshore tax evaders. You know, now if you're, if you're caught evading tax offshore, you could be subject to a penalty in certain circumstances up to 250% of the other paid tax, quite a significant deterrent. HMRC have also done a lot of work around cross-border tax arrangements for multinationals. This is uh, probably one of the more recent developments. So we've had the diverted profits tax, which interestingly, it was announced yesterday, has apparently brought in more money than was originally budgeted. Linked to that comes in the work that the UK has done with the OECD around debt, space erosion and profit shifting. And again, it's relatively early days for, for those kind of rule changes, but certainly HRC believe in the long run they should lead to much improved uh, tax take in the UK. And then finally what they term other measures, and that includes extending their data gathering powers and also pursuing work in the online marketplace. I think it's fair to say that tax rules by and large were dreamed up in the 20th century and in some cases the 19th century uh, when there was no such thing as an online marketplace and therefore some of those rules are clearly not fit for purpose when looking at uh, what happens in the online retail sector in particular. So HRC has been doing some work around that to try and improve that. So what actually came out of yesterday's budget in, in this area? Well, firstly, um, the government has committed a further £155 million pounds to additional staff and technology to ensure HMRC has the necessary resources to actually undertake the, the operations it does. There were also 18 specific anti-avoidance stroke evasion measures and these include some of the following things highlighted on this slide. So there is a new withholding tax on certain royalties. This is a, a, a quite a, um, a targeted piece of legislation uh, that is proposed that will impact businesses which operate with IP held in tax haven jurisdictions and where the, the bulk of the the, the company's operations are actually um, done in another offshore jurisdiction. And going forward, the UK income will be subject to withholding taxes in those scenarios. The, the obvious sort of areas that they're looking at there are some of the online communities, things like Facebook potentially could be subject to that. Secondly, there's uh, a new notification for people to tell HMRC of certain offshore structures that could be used to evade tax and there's uh, quite a specific set of rules around that. HMRC has also extended the assessment time limits for offshore non-deliberate non-compliance from 6 to 12 years, which is quite an increase, bearing in mind that where there is deliberate non-compliance, they already can go back up to 21 years from uh, the, the time when the uh, uh, understatement took place. There is a, a specific set of new set of rules designed to combat that fraud in labour provision in the construction sector, which is quite a niche thing, but is undoubtedly an area that HMRC believe in the past has been subject to significant tax leakage. Under depreciatory transactions, they have removed the six-year time limit, uh, and that is now an unlimited time period. There is the restriction of double taxation relief for permanent establishment businesses. This is 
designed to prevent those businesses effectively getting released twice, once in the overseas jurisdiction and secondly in the UK. Linked to what I was saying previously about some of the work HRC are now doing in the online space, they have uh, brought out some rules to ensure that in the online rat marketplace, providers um, are to be held jointly liable for traders VAT. So typically this would be where you've maybe got small traders operating on platforms such as eBay, um, where they are not, where they are holding themselves out not to be beyond the VAT threshold. Um, and HRC recognise the difficulty they have in policing that. They will now expect the online marketplace providers to be jointly liable should those traders uh, become untradeable. And finally, there's also some measures that were announced yesterday to prevent avoidance and evasion in the insolvency space and particularly around the use of Phoenixism. So as you can see, those specific areas, a lot of them are, are very focused, very targeted, which probably says as much about the previous hundred or so measures that are already in place, some of which are a more broad brush. But again, it just gives you the sense that HMRC are, are really pushing forward in what they see as their fight against the avoidance and evasion. And finally, they have also uh, produced a position paper on corporate tax and the digital economy, um, which again is all about them making sure in the, in the future that in, in the international arena they, they manage to tax in the UK what they see as value creation. So that gives you a sense of, of the details of yesterday. I'll conclude now with a few highlights uh, of what's come out of this and also a few missing parts, things that maybe Mr. Hammond didn't say that we kind of expected him to say. So in terms of the highlights piece, I think I'd go back to the areas that Sean covered around high housing and property and what um, Hillary mentioned around EIS and, and R&D and, and the targeting there, particularly going back to the, the chances being about the need to improve productivity levels in the UK economy. The missing part, I think this, some of this goes back to um, the need not to upset backbench MPs. So it's pretty clear they want to do something around the gig economy and non payroll labour. It's probably just not the right time at the moment, but I think unfortunately um, the direction of travel is, is all too set in stone in that area, assuming we have the same government in 12 months' time. The two bits that, that were, I guess, sadly backing yesterday, one was Brexit, there was no real mention of that, um, and if you think that, that if the current timeline is met, then we actually only have one more budget between now and then. So the one thing I would urge everyone on the call is, assuming your business is going to be impacted by Brexit, I wouldn't wait for another 12 months before you do anything about it. There is a lot you can do now to, to, to review how it might impact and how you might guard against sort of some, some serious negative impacts around that. And the final point is, is an area that we as a firm have lobbied for long and hard for the last few years around simplifying tax in general. Um, we do, we lobby because that's what our clients tell us is really important in me. In the most recent survey we did just before this budget, um, we were told that our clients, more than half of them, would be prepared to pay more tax if the, the, the tax code was significantly simplified. Unfortunately, there was very little yesterday that gave us any, uh, any moves in that way. So, um, that's all we've got time for now. I don't know if we've had any specific questions. I'm not aware of any. So, failing that, what I would say is that um, the slides will be available on our website. Um, I think the people who've been on the, on the call will get them forwarded to directly. Um, if you have any colleagues who like to listen to the webinar, it will be um, kept on our website as well, so you can listen to our wonderful dog in the future. Just like to say thanks very much to all the other
ever contributed, and thank you for listening. Goodbye. Your line has been muted.